Yeah. All right, everyone. Uh, welcome. And uh, here we go again for our third session for this semester. And uh, the start of chapter four, which is uh, programming references. Um, uh, I took a look at your assignments. I haven't yet finished marking them. They will be done uh, hopefully by Wednesday or Thursday this week. And then hopefully by, uh, before Friday, I will upload your uh, solutions. Oh, excuse me. I mean, I will upload your marks as well as the solution manager for the first assignment. Don't forget the second and third assignment are already online. So uh, basically, uh, uh, make sure we have one uh, due this Friday and then one next Friday. And also next Friday at the same time we have the first lab sheet. Oh wait, the lab sheet is the following week. So yeah, make sure you follow the deadlines uh, on the program uh, on, a, on the class program on the class plan. Okay, so this course is not about teaching C. Um, definitely, um, um, it's a refresher. That's the word that says here. Refresher. Refresher means is that we're gonna um, try to try to help you remember C plus plus. And definitely, I'm not going to go through complex stuff. The only things that we need to remember or refresh our memory on C and Python, by the way, is what we are going to use when we work with microprocessors and controllers. So it's definitely uh, it's not about programming per se, but it's about learning what we need to learn in order to use it for uh, our purposes only. And before we start the new chapter, we have a couple of slides left over from our last chapter when we talked about uh, embedded systems, right? And I said that these, the last three chapters are more or less related to uh, the topics of chapter four. So that's why we're going to start here. And uh, so the first thing I will do is I'm going to start with, um, yeah. So the first thing I will do is essentially to talk about why do we have to work with C++ and Python? Why not both, or why not, excuse me, why not one of them only? Why not, why not others? Well, the reason why uh, Python is being used is because of the Raspberry Pi, of course, and uh, the BeagleBone uh, microcontroller. C++ is used for Arduino. Actually, we don't use exactly C++. We use a special version of C++, and that is called Arduino. Uh, I'll explain that later. But of course, if you are comfortable with C or C++, the learning Arduino will be straightforward. All you have to do is uh, apply exactly the same techniques that you learned in C. So the first thing we talk about, what is the difference between C and Python? And why are they different? Some of these differences will not make sense to you today, but they will make sense when we do the hands-on stuff. So I understand that some of the stuff that we will be talking about in the beginning, at least in a couple of slides here, might be a little bit um, difficult to, to capture, but uh, it will make sense to you uh, in later times. Okay, so let's carry on. So the first thing is that the difference between Python and C, and the first benefit or the first, the first feature that Python provides is something called garbage collection. And no, this is not actual garbage. This is essentially, this is a real programming term. Garbage collection refers to the, see, every time you run a program, your program will utilize some memory, some RAM, some resources from your computer. And at the end of the program, um, it's supposed to give back those resources back to the system. It's like when you open a several applications at the same time, suddenly you find that your computer is hanging. That's because every application that you're using is using uh, all of these resources. Now, Python provides Garbage collection simply means that at the end of running the program, even if you don't close it, at, or just at the finish, or at the end of executing the task, right, it will automatically return all of the resources back to the system. So this way, your current program running, um, are running, it will not utilize or waste resources. Now, this is especially true if you are working with a device that is already limited in resources. Remember when we talked about um, Raspberry Pi and uh, Arduino and Vivovon, and we said that these are smaller machines and they have less capabilities? Uh, essentially, the reason why um, they're less capable is because, you know, the computer chip is very small. 
small device and therefore the hard drive, the RAM, and even the, the, the processor capabilities are all limited. So having um, the garbage collection feature is extremely powerful. So Python automatically supports it and without you doing anything extra, it automatically does that in the behind the scenes. You don't even have to program it to do anything. But C++ does not do it. You will have to do it. You have to program it yourself in order to do this. And that is why um, you don't see C++ used more often with Python or uh, with uh, Raspberry Pi or Arduino, excuse me, where, uh, or um, BeagleBone, because, um, because it's quite heavy duty and it utilizes a lot of uh, resources. And uh, remember, it's a computer on chip, so it's very limited to begin with. But when it comes to Arduino, Usually, we don't use Arduino that much by itself. Usually, we link it to an actual system. So this is where the resources come in handy. Now, the second difference is the way that you write the code. And this will, you will see immediately uh, as soon as we start writing code for C as well as Python. I can tell you right now that some of you right now, when they found out about C++, they were like, oh, God, not again. Because they remember how C++ was a nightmare to work with, how to code and write programs. And I remember it too, of course, when I first time learned C, it was a nightmare to me too as well. In fact, during my time, it was even far more worse compared to you guys today uh, because of the IDE, availability of IDE. But Python is much, much easier to write. It's almost close to the human language or you know, almost to an algorithm. You can write Python code that almost resembles almost an algorithm in English. You can write if statement that resembles a human language. Uh, there is no semicolon in Python. There is no brackets to begin with. But uh, it's also a lot of other stuff that is a lot more simplified compared to C++. Um, the syntax or the grammar of the language in C++ is far more difficult. And that's why it's a... Uh, it's uh, people dread or really don't like to learn it. Uh, Python, as you will see, it's much more fun to learn and much more one fun to work with. So what's next? Uh, rapid prototyping is a way of writing code and execute it very, very quickly. And again, Python does provide that very rapidly. And it's really useful for animation and also for C++. But for C, it doesn't provide it at all. Uh, you cannot do rapid Installation, um, this is probably outdated by now because Python 3 or 3.8 onwards has become easy to download or install. But, um, before that, in the past, like C Python 2.x, like 2.7 or 2.6 was a nightmare to install and, and work with. Um, you had to do a lot of work, but now these things have become simplified. Um, C is also, has always been easy to install and to work with. You just have to download a compiler, install it, and good to go. In fact, you might have noticed this already if you already did the setup uh, that you have to create or you have to select the path for Python, but for C, you didn't have to do anything. Uh, so that's one example of simplicity and difficulty. OK, this point right here, I'm going to skip because no matter how hard I try to explain it now, it won't make any sense to you right now. However, it will make perfect sense once we do the program. Um, let's just say that the variables are accessible, uh, are accessible every inside functions or loops, or whatever. But in C, they're not. If that doesn't make any sense, it's fine. It's difficult to explain now. You, I will have to show you the code, and then I'll explain to you then. So let's just put this one on hold for now. Functions. Uh, by functions, we mean the way you write a function in Python and C. They both do the same purpose. They both basically perform a task. But the way you write it in C, excuse me, the way you write it in Python, it's much, much more simpler compared to C. Um, once again, that will also make sense when we do the actual programming. And efficiency, uh, because of the simplicity of Python, because it's object-oriented programming, and it's also easier to read, it's much, much easier to maintain. Uh, C++ code, on the other hand, is very difficult to read sometimes because of all of these brackets and semicolons and Syntax, so it makes it difficult to use. And finally, um, and this last feature here is very, very powerful for Python, which means that it's dynamically created code. 
dynamically created code or dynamic programming means simply we can write a program that will write another program, um, almost like uh, the Terminator, almost like AI. In fact, exactly like AI. See, um, you can write a Python program that based on certain parameters that you create, it will write another program built in within it. And that in turn can be also created or can be also be developed to write yet another program from within. So you can make your program becomes dynamic, uh, created. Um, that's because of the features that have already been discussed above. The, the scope of the variables, the, the syntax-based functions, excuse me, uh, the context-based functions, and so on and so forth. Once again, these features may not be clear now, but just let you know that these features allow you to write programs that create other programs. And this means you can have things like AI and fuzzy logic and more advanced programming uh, paradigms compared to C++. C++ is usually static, means it has to be written by a human, and therefore it's quite limited in scope. So now, obviously, if you're thinking about all of this, and then you're wondering, okay, if Python is have all of these great features, then why are we still using C? And why are we can, why can we just switch completely to Python and throw away C because it's outdated and all of that? Well, actually, despite all of these features that you have with Python, C++ still that does have a number of amazing features or advantages. Number one, those features that you have in Python, they come at a price. Because of this simplicity and because of this ease of use, Python is relatively easier to process compared to Python. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Python is, is relatively slower compared to C++. The program compile and run and operate and function much faster compared to Python. C++ in this way, if it's written properly and completely, it, must, it will run much faster compared to Python. Because Python has to do a lot of more work, it has to simplify the code, make it easier to read, and then write another code, makes it a little bit slower. Now, this could be an issue for you if you want your system to be very responsive. So if you want the system to be very responsive, then C++ is your best friend. If you don't mind a little bit of delay, we're talking about microseconds delay here, then you can go for fine. Another reason why C++ is very powerful still is because of hardware abstraction, which we discussed last week. We said that hardware abstraction essentially is how you can link your hardware systems to your software or to your motherboard. Uh, oh, it's in the, in the first slide, in the first uh, chapter. So C++ was written originally specifically for hardware abstraction. So that's why it is uh, more powerful to that. It is, that's why it's primarily, and it's still until today, used for that purpose. Python, on the other hand, is used for simulation, for smart, for advanced system, as well as for um, uh, AI and um, smart or dynamic coding. Okay, and there are other differences. I suggest that you go through online and find them and then basically uh, understand those differences. Okay, so now before we begin programming, I need to talk to you about program debugging. If you uh, had experience with C++ and it wasn't a pleasant experience, chances are that you were not doing it right or you were doing something wrong and that causes you to have problems and therefore nightmares working with C++ or programming in general. And so that's why I want to present this slide to you right now before we begin coding, so that you would have it in mind every time you're having a problem with your code. The very first advice that I will tell everyone in the beginning, especially beginners or those who forgot about coding, is to go slow. Do not attempt to write the complete program at once. You will only suffer if you do this. Uh, essentially, uh, uh, basically, you instead of writing the whole program at once, you will have to write uh, in small pieces. Actually, there is one advice before that, and I forgot to add it. And that advice is create your algorithm first. Create your algorithm first before you begin coding.
Okay, so uh, we talked about the algorithm last in the first session, in the beginning of the semester, and we saw what's the difference between algorithm and program. And we said that an algorithm essentially is the program that, um, excuse me, the algorithm is the program as well, but it written in human language and therefore easier for you to understand. Uh, once you have the algorithm ready, it's just a matter of converting that algorithm into code. If you're trying to do that, like if you try to create an algorithm while at the same time writing the code itself, you're gonna run into a nightmare because you are doing two things at once. You're thinking about a plan and at the same time you're debugging. So that's actually gonna make it very challenging for you. So instead divide and conquer. Start by writing the algorithm first, have it already, have the plan ready, you know what you're gonna do, and then it's just a matter of converting to code. Then when you do that, you do that in pieces. That's what I meant by here in small blocks. Don't try to attempt the whole or try to convert the whole algorithm into one program. Instead, do it in pieces. Perhaps, perhaps the first step into block one and then so on and so forth. And test your block one. If it works, then good. If it's not, then fix that one first before you move on and add another block. Now, if you do get errors, and you will, then the very first thing you have to understand is that error codes or messages are your best friend. The error codes are usually very, very informative. They tell you exactly where the error is, they tell you what to do, they tell you how to fix it. And if the message, if the message is clear enough, then all you have to do is just follow the instructions and then do it. If not, then all you have to do is Google that error code and just copy paste the message, put on Google and you'll find plenty of solutions online to do it. You guys are lucky that you have this. Back in my time, we didn't have any of that. In fact, we had to do programming from a book, a real book, a real paper book. And there was no such thing as copy paste the, the error. In fact, in our time, we didn't even have IDEs. We had to write programming using the old fashioned way. And I'll show you that in a minute. If you have multiple errors or multiple codes, then don't try to solve everything at once. Most of the time, when you have multiple codes, let's say you have five or seven error codes, don't panic. Most of the time, it's only the first one that causes the problem. If you fix that one, the others will also be fixed. Sometimes when you, when you have multiple codes or multiple errors, they are actually dependent on, on each other. Um, for example, if you define a variable in one line and then you use the same variable in an if statement, if that variable was not defined properly, you're going to get two errors, not one. First, the first statement, the definition of the error, the variable, and then the second is the F statement. But then you don't have to do the work twice. All you have to do is go back and fix the first line, and then the F statement will be fixed properly. Unless, of course, there's another problem. So chances are that you have only a few errors in the beginning, and then fix those first one error code at a time. OK, now I come to. This part right here actually is one of the biggest problem with programming. And I'm gonna highlight it here and I'm gonna come back to it in a minute. Uh, I'm gonna skip this one for a second. I'm gonna go on to the next point. So you can comment out sections of your program to troubleshoot the problem and try to find out the, the, the cause of the problem. Now, you know what, I'll talk about it now. You see, if you have an error and your program is not running, Believe me or not, this is the easy thing to do because that means you know what the problem is, you know what to do, and you know how to fix it, or at least you can find out. But the other problem is, is when you run your program and there is no errors whatsoever, there's no code, it's, it's running fine, it's running, but it's not doing the job that you want it. Let me give you an example. Um, you write a program that says that add numbers one and one. So if you, the program should function like this. Program number one, uh, take number one and then add another one, it becomes one plus one equal two. But imagine that your program, instead of doing that, it's actually saying one plus one equal 11. It basically takes one and one and put it next to each other. There is no errors, there is no syntax error, there's no problems with your code, but the program is not doing the job properly. And if that's the case, then you have a problem that the real problem is, is that you don't know where the problem, you don't know where the, where the issue is. You see, the error code will always tell you 
the error is at this line. Go back to that line and fix it. And at least you know where the problem is. Or at the very least, you know where generally the problem is. You can just comment out that area and you can try to debug. But if your program is error free, no errors whatsoever, but it's not doing the job that you expected, then you don't even know where the problem is. And you have to then debug the whole thing from the beginning until the end. So in this case, all you have to do is the following, which is try to comment out or try to isolate sections of your program and hopefully you can try or trace the problem. This way, the only way to do this is that you try to check the logic of the program and compare it with your algorithm. The, or try to trace what's going on with the problem with the program and compare it with your algorithm and see if the plan, if whatever you plan um, is there or not. Okay. Okay, so now I know that some of this or a lot of this is still theory and all, but it will make perfect sense to you. Uh, once we do the actual programming. And um, later on, when you, or if you have coding problem or debugs or issues like that, come back to this page and go through it again. This is like your guide to how to find errors or problems with your code. Okay, last slide before we begin with the actual hands-on stuff. Last slide for the theory, I promise. And which is, we're going to introduce something called integrated development environment. By far, in my opinion, the best thing that ever happened when it comes to programming. See, back in my time, the way we do the programming was that we actually open up Notepad. Yes, the Notepad that you see here, this guy right here. And we write the program here in Notepad, but then we save the file. We don't save the file as TXT. We save it as CPP or .py, which is the program format for Python or C++. And then we'll have to open another, the command prompt, which is right here, and then run the program. Um, let's say Python, uh, and then we run the program from there. You know what I mean? So, by the way, you still can do that now or today. In fact, we will do that using this. But unfortunately, uh, Notepad does not provide any sort of feedback. It does not tell you anything. If your program runs, perfect. If it doesn't run, it will tell you there is error. That's it. It doesn't tell you where the error is or what it is to begin with. You'll have to figure it out yourself. So you can imagine how our life was a nightmare back in the days. But for you guys, or back when the IDE started, it was a gift from the heavens, really, when it first arrived. So essentially an integrated development environment, that's why they call it integrated, because it provides all the features of a, of a programming editor. It allows you to write code. It allows you to not only to write the code, but also to check the code. Uh, it allows you to write code, uh, to try to use uh, automation tools like simulation, uh, debugging. It allows you, it contains a debugger or a test it will even provide you with a language compiler and interpreter. These are all parts of uh, ways of making the programming life easier. So this is how the program, sometimes when you write the code, or as you write the code in real time, it tells you where the error is. Uh, other features such as autocomplete, basically you don't have to write the whole line, you just start writing and then the code will be automatically completed for you. That'll be also a great feature and so on and so forth. So this is why, uh, we're gonna definitely gonna use IDEs and not write on our own. And our best friend for this semester is Genie. And this is our, the Genie we're going to be working with. I'm starting the program right now, yeah. So essentially, uh, this is essentially the IDE. It doesn't look much right now, but actually it's a very powerful and very useful IDE. It can be work or it can work with any programming language provided that there's a proper compiler installed. And that's what we did in our setup or in the setup, in the steps that I gave you earlier on today. Essentially, I asked you to install the, or to do the actual setup. And these are the steps. Essentially, you have to install the C compiler, install Python or the Python compiler if you'd like, even though the Python doesn't have compiler, but same idea and then install Genie. And essentially, um, that's how uh, you do it. Okay, before we move any further, 
I assume that everyone actually installed or have already successfully installed Genie as well as C++ as well as Python. Is there anyone here that did not do this or is having a problem? Now is the time to raise your hand. Well, the very first uh, link that I provided in the Telegram group is um, in installing the C++ compiler. And uh, yeah, which is this one right here. All you have to do is come down here and click on download. You're good to go. now, by the way, these links are for, C for Windows. But if you are, uh, if you are using a uh, Mac or you, then you have to download the, the links for Mac. Somebody is replying or saying something. Let me check. C++ cannot run. Did you install the compiler? Did you install the compiler like I did here? Well, basically all you have to do is download the compiler and run it and uh, essentially um, run the program. Uh, Okay, I actually found another program on YouTube. It's called Genie with, with C++. So Genie. Genie C++ for Windows 10. Uh, are you using the same Windows like, oh, wait, what happened? Yes. Um, Nirosh, you can come in. So I suggest, um, sorry, that, that was not me, that's the guy. So Nirosh, I suggest that you try and see this video right here, uh, which is installing Genie for C++ or setting it up for C++. How you install the compiler. By right, all you have to do is install the compiler and then it will be good to go. And then, then install the C++. Let me just glance through this. So yes, this is when you go and get the, the compiler, then install it. Uh, yeah, this is the same page I showed you earlier. Then I think we might be. I'm watching this video and so to see if I missed something. Hold on, yeah. Yeah, I think you did not. Maybe what happened to Uni Roj is that you did not name the file properly or you did not run it properly or compile it properly. But I'm gonna go through that together with you guys. I'm gonna show you how to actually uh, do it. Uh, to, I mean, to run the program in, uh, in Genie. There is no uh, special settings in Genie. All you have to do is just install the compiler and you're good to go. But anyway, you can watch this video in completion in completely if you want to make sure that it's all there. So how, do, and this is by the way, the download program for Genie. Now, if you're using Windows, here we go. This is the file. If you're using Mac, so this is the one. Uh, same thing for Python. And don't forget when you install Python for the first time uh, that you have to select add to path. This image here that I showed earlier in the group, you'll have to click here. Otherwise, you won't be able to run all of your Python programs everywhere. So how do you know that you installed it correctly? Well, let's take a look at it. So first things first. Uh, Create a folder. This is outside of your genie. I'm going to walk you through the process, Niraj, of, in, uh, of, of running a program on on uh, on genie, a C++ program. So create a Python. Let's just call it my CPP or my programs, whatever you want to call it. But make sure, or for it's a good practice not to have any space in the program or a folder name. So don't don't say my program like this with a space here. Instead just without any space, one word. So in this folder, we are going to put all of our programs right here. So close it and then open Genie and then find this folder, the one that you just created. So open 
desktop, my program, and here we are. So this right here will be your working space. Uh, there's nothing to open, so let me just close this for now. So first of all, you have to create a new file. So new. And then, uh, sorry guys, I'm getting an international call. I'll be, I'm gonna pause for, for a minute. Sorry guys. Okay, sorry guys about that. Uh, all right, so uh, the create a file, the very first thing you do when you create a file is to save as, and you have to name it anything you want. Uh, first of all, go and find the same folder that you created, and then name it, uh, I don't know, test one, whatever you want to call it, but no spaces, and then survey.cpp. If your file is not saved as CPP, the system will not know that it's a program or it's a C++ program. Remember that Genie can run Python, can run C++, can run Android, can run Java, anything you want. You have to tell it what the program is by using the proper format or the proper file convention. If you want to, for example, if you want to uh, work on Python, just all you do is go back, create another folder, come here, and then save as uh, my first, and then dot .py. So that will be a Python program, okay? So how about the code? The best way to, to test your program and to make sure no errors is to go to www. Uh, what do you call the uh, W3 schools. Is that right? Yeah. The one I told you about last, last time that we're going to use for our tutorials. And I'm going to go and come here to... Yeah, this one right here. This is the hello world. Copy the whole thing. Remember, our point right now is not about programming. Our point is to double check the installation. So don't worry about copy pasting code. All you have to do is that we want to run this program in order to test that our installation works. So copy right here and come back here and save it. By the way, you notice how the code is already colored like this. If let's say you did not save it as CPP, let's say you save it as .txt or anything else without any format. Uh, okay, Genie is smarter than this. So save as uh, something else, something .txt. Oh, it still doesn't work. Okay, let's try again. So, let's see. Okay, this is what I want to show you. If you copy paste like this, you will see that the color coding is not there anymore, or it's not there at all. Because the program doesn't know what this is, what the untitled is. You need to know if it's C++ or Python. So first of all, after you copy paste, you have to save as, and then go to whatever you want to save it, and then call it whatever you want to call it. So C, or my first CPP, um, you know, my first C. If you want, whatever name you would like to call it, as long as it, it does not start with a number and there is no spaces. And then CPP in the end, dot CPP. As soon as you say, I'm not sure if you can hear the thunder sound, but it's happening. So as soon as you save the file as CPP, the color coding happens. So straight away, you know that you have now a properly written C++ program. Now, if I click on run, execute straight away, it won't run, actually you are gonna get an error like this. It's not recognized or whatever way. Because in C++, you cannot just execute straight away. First, you have to compile. And unfortunately, this is, this is always to do with C++. So first step is compile and wait for the compiling results. You have to wait here and see what happens to the compiler. It's actually still running. Until you see here, compilation finally finished successfully. If this one is not there, that means something wrong with the compiler. It's not installed properly. If it's compiled properly, then we're good to go. Then you can go ahead to build. And again, wait for it. You see build successfully or compilation. Actually, the build is optional. This compiling only is enough. Then execute and you'll see hello world. So once again, installing the compiler is not enough. 
first of all, you have to install the compiler, install Genie, save the file properly to the proper format, which is .cpp, and finally, you need to compile first and then execute. I'm actually going to write it down. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> install compiler, install Genie, uh, write code, oh wait, uh, create folder, no space, no spaces in the, in the folder name, um, create file, save as, as something, something, what is that stuff? Something, something dot CPP, so that the compiler would know that this is a C++ program. Then write your code. Then, when ready, when ready, click compile, compile. And then, if OK, then click on execute. Okay, so this is the procedure that you'll have to do in order to run your Hello World program. Now, in order to reduce this headache, this, this step right here, you can just copy paste the Hello World program from the W3 school. If you don't have access to the internet, it's also available in the slides. If you go to chapter four slides, you will see that it's also right here. Again, but this is actually a picture, so you may not be able to copy paste, you have to type it. Now, if you are typing the program and not copy pasting it, then you have to be careful to write it. Uh, that's why I suggest that you go to W3 Schools, C++, copy paste the Hello World program, and then you'll be good to go. So you don't have to worry about this step. Okay. So can I just run it here? Yes, of course you can. But then the point of today's session is not about C++ only, but also about learning Genie and setting it up. So once again, I suggest to everyone to go and do this step right now. Install, set it up, compile, run, and make sure you get to see this, the hello world message. If you see it, then you're good to go. If you really can see it, please put a, do this, uh, raise your hand. You know, in, in our group right now on Teams, there's the raise your hand feature. So if you are able to do it successfully, and if you're able to see Hello World, like here, like you see in front of you, then click on raise your hand, like I'm doing right now. So go ahead and click on, if you've done it correctly or successfully, then click on raise your hand. So I would know uh, who did this and who's doing it correctly. So I'm gonna give you a moment now, about five or 10 minutes to try and do this. And once again, uh, give it a try and then make sure you set it up correctly. And if you're still having a problem, then come and unmute yourself and explain to me what's going on. Maybe I will even allow you to share your screen and then show me the situation on your laptop. So go ahead, guys, give it a try and uh, give you some time to give it a try. And once you're able to see Hello World, raise your hand, okay? Go ahead.
Excuse me, sir. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, go ahead. So when we copy the example from W3 schools, uh, when we compile it, it says it has an error. Can I see your screen? Uh, sure, sir. Down here, sir. <clears throat> Is there anyone else experiencing the same problem? Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, keep us asking around. Um, OK. You know what? Let's watch that video on the setup with C++ completely. See what we missed. So this guy right here, I'm going to I'm going to share my screen with audio. I'm going to run a video. We watch it together about setting up Genie with C++. There might be a step that I missed. So let's check it out. By the way, can you hear the audio from the from the video from the, the one I'm playing now? Well, no, sir. no huh? because I'm using the web uh, today. I'm using the web uh, version of Teams, and uh, and basically the the web version doesn't have that audio problem. By the way, I forgot to check. Uh, is my voice better today? Does it fade in and out like last time? It's better now, sir. Yeah, because that problem comes with the standalone um, Teams application, the Windows-based. But if I use the web-based, then it uh, doesn't have that problem. But then, then again, if I share my screen now, I cannot share the audio. Um, anyway, I'm going to watch it anyway with audio. Even if you're going to hear just bear with me for a minute, about five minutes. Then I'm going to explain to you what's going on. I'm going to mute myself anyway. So, yes? Actually, for the C++ compiler, the ah, you know what happened? happened? Do you know what happened? Uh, there must be something that I forgot or missed. What is it? Sorry, sir. Go ahead, Nirosh. No, just now uh, you sent the link in Telegram for the C++ compiler. Yeah. Uh, uh, when we ran it, it said that um, it's an old version and we have to download the new version to continue. Then go ahead, download the new version. Maybe the link that I give you was an old or, oh yeah, because the link that I give you was from last few months ago for the last semester. Uh -huh. Then in this case, maybe that's the case. So in this case, download the latest one and then uh, use it. 
we downloaded sir still cannot run well thank you for your contribution <laughs> okay sir Okay, so uh, let's do this now. Actually, what the guy says is that um, to check whether the compiler is installed properly on your machine or not, just open the command prompt. Um, just go and search for CMD, CMD. And then you open the command prompt, right? And then essentially type GCC. GCC actually is the name of the compiler. And uh, Actually, if you type GCC only and you get this fatal error, no input files, that is actually okay. In fact, that is good. Uh, if you get something else like um, edge or help or something like that, then we have a problem. So it only means that your compiler has been installed. Um, regarding what Neeroj said, the link that I provided to you guys is that it seems to be outdated because that was the one from last year when I created the slides. Looks like there is a newer version. Thank you very much, Nirosh, for letting me know about this one. So yeah, this is the first step to check the compiler is installed properly. And that is to type GCC in the command prompt. And if you get fatal error, that's fine. So that means it's actually installed properly. Let's move on to the next step. Okay, in this step, he's creating a folder like we did before. Again, notice that the, the folder name doesn't have any spaces. Then you create the file, save us. Okay, I'm gonna talk about something that Muhammad Shafiq mentioned. Some of us have internet issues. Uh, I understand that, but unfortunately, I cannot do anything about it. Uh, all I can do is to create this video and create the training or to create the, the, the lesson. If you are able to follow along now, then good to go. If you are unable to follow along now, then you can watch the recording later. Unfortunately, uh, having poor internet connection at your place is not something that I can control, unfortunately. If it was up to me, then I would have you all in the lab today and we do it in the lab, but unfortunately, we can't do that. So having uh, poor internet, of course, especially now that we have a thunderstorm, I know it will affect you and might affect you following this up. But if you're gonna, unfortunately, you're gonna have to survive, okay? So do not uh, think because of the poor internet that you're going to fail the course. No, you have today, you have tomorrow, you have next week, you have plenty of time to watch this video again until you have proper internet. So. To be honest with you, I don't want to hear this excuse again, or I don't want to hear this again, because it's not something that I can control. You having bad internet, it's not really in my control. So uh, go to a place where you have better internet. So once again, the folder name must have no uh, spaces, and the file name also must have no spaces. And the extension must be .cpp, as I said.
Okay, Nirosh and everybody else, I think uh, what's happening is that you need to use all three buttons, not just the compile and the run. You need to compile, then build, then execute. So go ahead and try one more time. So before you try one more time, make sure the following is true, that the program itself, the file itself doesn't have any spaces, then try again. Maybe for me it works without building, but for you, you may have to do it again. So compile, once it's successful, then build. Wait for it to succeed again, and then execute. So the three steps, okay? So let's watch that video again. Because I watched again the video, there is nothing else missing. Yeah, basically I watched the video now with you and you can see that the steps in the video is exactly the same as the one I gave you. All you have to do is install the compiler and then run the program. And uh, it runs, it, does, it did exactly the same steps that I did. And essentially all you have to do is install, uh, is basically install the compiler. Uh, here is the compiler, maybe this is the, the older one. Is, is this the link that I give you, right? So even if this was the older one, you can then get the latest one, GeForce compiler, and then you can download or you can get updates. So if I click on get updates, or no, oh, this is something else. So basically download it and then work with the compiler. So as for the problem that you have, Nirosh, I'm not sure what's going on with your system or what's going on in your installation. Uh, let me uh, pause for a minute. I want to pause this for a minute. Let me uh, mute myself for a minute. I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to check something out. Then I'll get back to you. So it's also one hour anyway. Let's just take 10 minutes break and I'll get back to you. Hopefully I can find a solution for this compiler issue. Okay. I'll be back in 10 minutes. Uh, we're still in a break, but I want to talk about this uh, compiler issue. I double checked with even with ITMS and I double checked with uh, other people as well. There is nothing new. This is exactly the same steps like I described it. All you have to do is download the compiler for C++ and then install it and then run it and then install Genie and then run it. That's nothing else you do. If you have not installed it correctly, or if you named the file incorrectly, or something like, something like that, then um, you may have to do a uh, different setting. Nirosh, are you using Windows or something else, or Mac? Maybe that's another reason. I'm using Windows uh, now, can sir. Can I? So now it's running? Yes, now it's running. So what sir. was the problem? Uh, I'm not sure what was the problem, but now it's running, sir. I think what you did the first time was that you did not click, click on uh, uh, compile, build, and execute. I think you clicked on compile and then straight away execute. Uh, Maybe so. Fine. Yeah, I think so because uh, it, it, 
possibly this is a scenario. So once again, uh, I want you guys, who those who were able to do this successfully, I want you to, if you go here, I want you to click on uh, raise your hand so I can see your hands here. Uh, are you watching my screen? Yeah, yeah you, are, uh, you can see my screen, right? So Neerosh, I know you program run, so raise your hand. You can go over here and click on raise your hand and you'll see it. Uh, I want to see, yeah, but now I'm seeing hands. So I want to see a count of hands for those who were able to successfully run the pro program and essentially um, see the hello world. Go ahead and do it. Uh, while I see, uh, I want to see a, a count of hands. While we are, also, while we are we're still in break, but I want to see the count of hands. If you have any questions or any confusion or any problems with your, with your program, you can ask me now, either by texting or you can uh, unmute yourself and ask me right now. But once again, if everything is fine, just raise your hand. I'm going to go through the steps once, once again, uh, install the compiler, and maybe use latest version. Thanks, Mirosh. Uh, and then install Genie, create folder, no spaces in the folder name. Create file, no spaces in file name. Then five, maybe, let's make it a five, yeah. Save as something, something, whatever you want. Uh, whatever you like, but no spaces, no spaces. No spaces and no special characters, yeah? And not start with a number. And then uh, write the code, you can copy it from W3 schools, and then when ready, click on compile. Yeah, I have to update my step here. When ready, click on compile, and then if okay, If OK, then build. Then if OK, then execute. OK? So that's um, the steps that you need to run your program. So if you are able to do this and you were able to see, uh, if you're able to see the program and you see the Hello World, that means your installation is good to go and you're ready to do the C++ tutorial and the classes. Also, you're ready to do the, 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 the lab sheet or the very first lab sheet. So go ahead and uh, I want to see more hands. For those who have not raised their hands, uh, either you are not doing it or you're having a problem. Either way, I would like to hear from you. So I can see that there's only about 10 people. Uh, that's me actually. So one, two, three, about probably less than 10 people raise their hand. That means the others are not raising their hands. Uh, Either you're just watching, you're not really doing anything, or you're simply having a problem. Either way, I would like to hear from you what's going on. So go ahead and raise your hand. Fogendran, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Fendron reinstalling. Sorry, but it's raining extremely heavily. And uh, here, and the lighting is very bad. I have to turn on my desktop because I don't want to risk listening to the lecture through my phone. Someone reinstalling. I'm having a problem, so face the same problem as me, Raj. Ayman, I suggest, uh, Ayman Daniel, yeah, I suggest that you start with another file. If you're having the same problem that Neeraj did, what do you say? What I suggest you do is the same file that you have right now, just save as file, save as, and name it something else. I'm guessing that if you, um, something, let's just let's call it uh, something else. Okay, that's, that's funny. So test two, for example, right? 
and save it as something else, right? Whatever, a different name, and then do the compilation and running properly. Compile, then wait for it to succeed, yeah? Don't click, click, click quickly. You have to compile, wait for it to succeed, then build, wait for it to succeed, and then execute, and hopefully it would work fine. So I hope now, Daniel, that will work for you. I can't even open the streaming. Um, once again, guys, yeah, good luck, Daniel. Uh, Ayman. Um, sorry, sorry, guys, uh, I really have to be brutal here now and say this. Um, network problems, uh, streaming problems, uh, these things I cannot control. It's not in my hands to fix for you. It's in your hands, not me. Uh, I cannot control the weather and I cannot control the rain. So you may have to resolve it yourself. Okay, so um, if you cannot be able to catch or follow up today with me uh, in the live version, I suggest that you try again in another day. Doesn't mean I'm not saying go home now. I'm saying if you miss something right now, it's okay. Just hold on, try your best. And then later on, well, you can watch the recording and then essentially try again. Okay. But uh, there's no need for me to, to report to me networking problem. Okay. Uh, those who are afraid from the from the from the thunderstorm, I agree. Oh, I, I see your point. But uh, the rain stopped or the thunderstorm ended, so hopefully it's better now. Yes, sir. I'll watch the video. I'll try again later. But it doesn't mean that you leave now. I suggest strongly that you stay with us and also uh, continue complete the session. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say that the QR code has been shared a long time ago. I, I put it in the Telegram group earlier on today. So I don't want anyone else today to tell me that they forgot about the QR code. Let's see. Okay, there is more hands being raised. Good job, guys. For those who have, by the way, uh, have raised their hands, I have nothing to do right now. You can go ahead and uh, look at your slides because the slides, the chapter four slides, have more things to do. Uh, like, uh, and I'm gonna go through the slides myself, but you can go through those ahead of me while I'm waiting for more people to to, to join, uh, to, to complete. But unfortunately, I can't wait forever, so I have to give more time and then we're gonna continue with the tutorial, with the session. So I'll give you more time. Again, for those who are having problems, try to explain to me what are the problems that you're facing. Okay, we're having more and more hands. Kishan Raj, you are on hold. Why are you on hold? Uh, Kishan Raj Konalan, you are on hold. Maybe this guy is uh, restarting his system. Anyway, so let's just see what's going on. Uh, I can't even open the streaming. Why can't you? You're supposed to be using a laptop. Uh, the link, go and come to the Teams page and join the session. Once again, for those who are unable to see the, the session, you just have to come. You come to our team page and you can come here and click on join. And then you can actually come and see the session. This is we are here right now. For those who are unable to see the view. Okay, great. More and more hands are being raised. Uh, I hope you guys are raising your hands only if it's working. Don't raise your hand uh, just, to, just to, to raise your hand. It has to work. If you are raising your hand, but it's not working, you'll be cheating yourself. So make sure that it's uh, working. Good. Oh, it works for Daniel. So I guess it works, Daniel, right? Or Ayman, right? So I guess uh, it works now. So I hope it was the same issue that uh, Nirosh faces now. So once again, if you're having the same error that Nirosh showed us, that means you are doing the compiling part incorrectly. And if you try it again, even if let's say, if you try compile and then execute and it won't run, and then you try it correctly after that, it still won't work. So try the other trick, which is renaming the file to something else. This will confuse the compiler and you will think of it as a new compilation altogether. The way the compiler works is that it saves the compilation in memory sometimes. So even though you modify the file, it might think that it's the old compilation. So to trick or to force the compiler to try to start again from fresh, rename the file, start with a new file altogether. Okay, I'm seeing more and more hands. 
That's very good job, guys. Uh, but still, we have plenty of hands not raised yet. Once again, for those who are not yet raised their hands or you're struggling with it, please tell me what kind of a problem you're facing. If you would like to share your screen to show me the problem, go ahead. Uh, for those who are having problems, please show me your screen. Anyone, like for example, Lukman or Balfrid or something like that. If you would like to show me your screen and to show me the problem, then I will gladly help out, try to help out. So for example, uh, there's a lot of names here that uh, have not raised their hands. The, I'm assuming either they don't know how to do it or you just have to come here and click on raise your hand. And of course, do that only if your program runs or they're still having a problem with their program. Let's see the messages. No new messages. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So, mm, who's uh, that? I'm Balpreet here. Okay. Um, okay, for mine, it shows that the process failed. Why is it? Can I see what's going on? Uh, right. Can you share your screen? I'm going to stop mine and then you can go ahead and share your screen. Oops, you're watching my messages. Okay, so yeah, go ahead and share your screen and show me what's going on. Uh, so can you see? Hello? I forgot I muted myself. Anyway, uh, go to file and save as. Go to file. I click on it, save as. Okay. I want to see the folder that you are saving. Okay, my program is fine. And then change the name of the file. Right now it says text one. Is that right? Yes. Just change it to something else. Let's call it text two. Okay, and then save. And now, slowly uh, click compile, only compile, nothing else. And wait for it. Process failed. Oh, did you actually install the compiler? Uh, yes. Uh, what is it? Show me how you did it. But, sir, it shows in this way, but I don't know. I'm not sure. I think you only downloaded the compiler, but you did not run it. Okay, oh. can you open your, can you open the command prompt? Go to uh, your Windows. Okay. And search or, and click on CMD. Uh, what's going on here in your case? The compiler is not there. It's not installed. What I think happened is that you downloaded the compiler, but you did it, not install it. Oh, okay. Can you, can you show me, when, when you, did you actually click on uh, the first link, which is the C++ link, and downloaded the compiler? Uh, yes. But, can you but show it, me what is, okay, after you did that, you downloaded a file, is that right? Yes, but, but I'm not sure uh, which one should I choose, actually. Go ahead and show me the folder where you have that compiler. Go ahead. Um, your screen is frozen. I don't, I'm still watching your genie. Yeah. Show me the file. The, the, after you click on the compiler, what happened? Wait, Wait, Arthur. Yeah. Should I click? I need to see the screen. I'm right now. I'm watching uh, the genie. Oh. Uh, do you having? Are you having multiple screens? No, sir. But actually, after I click that uh, compiler, it shows the same thing again. You have not installed it. I need to see it. I need to see that for that folder. Um, let me show you my screen. Okay. Let me show you my screen. 
Okay. Okay, so here's my screen. Okay. Oh, so, uh, I think I need to mute you now. Okay. Okay, so if you remember from the Telegram group, I give you a link for the GCC compiler. Okay. If you. Uh, Where is it? This one right here. If I click on this link right now, I will go to this page. I know this might be an outdated compiler, but it's still gonna work. And all you have to do is just click on download right here, this button right here. And you click on it, it will download the file. I know there's a lot of stuff happens here, but don't worry, don't touch anything. It will download the file directly. Wait for it, and here we go. Now you're going to download this. I already downloaded it, by the way, but I'm going to do it again anyway. I'm going to put it in my desktop. And then you have to go to where you downloaded it, which is right here, this file right here. This is the compiler. But downloading the compiler is not enough. You still need to install it. So after you download it, you still have to run it. It's basically a program. So then you come here and you double click on it, or wherever you saved it. You double click on it, and it will run. You wait for it, and I'm going to get a warning saying that you're about to change the system, blah, 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 blah. Don't worry, just click yes. I don't want to click yes here because I already have the compiler. So for me, I'm going to click no, but in your case, you have to click on yes, okay? And then, and then follow the instructions. Yes, 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 run the way until you finish installation. Once you're done, finish installation, then you finish installation of the compiler then you're ready to run your program. You go back to Genie, and then you're good to go. Uh, to make sure that Genie recognizes the changes, close it, and then open it up again so that it refreshes. It recognizes the compiler, and then it will run just fine. OK, so I hope that helps you, uh, Balpreet, and others as well. Once again, remember, you have to install the, uh, the thing and not just download it. Balpreet, did that help? Um, Babri, can you uh, once again share your screen? Okay, other people who are not raising their hands, um, if you're still having a problem, you can tell me about it now. Okay, Babri did not reply. Maybe she's installing stuff. Okay, so now let's get back to our work. So uh, I hope you can resolve the issues with your installation and setup. I have given you the instructions for installation since Sunday. I specifically said go and try it before the session so that you don't have to go through what you're going through right now. So for those who are not raised their hands yet, I suggest you try to get the setup done as soon as possible. So now I'm going to have to start with the content of the tutorial, which is and the session, which is the actual refresher on C++. By the way, we are not working only on C++, but we are also working on Genie. You need to be familiarizing with Genie as well. Okay. So let's go to the slides. By the way, the the slides you're looking at right now, chapter four slides are already on our Moodle page. If you go to Moodle, and you will see that the content is already there. So if you go to, let's change this to student. So if you go to here, you will see the, yeah, we are actually here. So if you click on this, you will see the C++ slides, which uh, I'm using right now this one. Also, uh, you can get some notes. Uh, again, further notes on C++ and general programming and troubleshooting. And also, you can see my videos. So for those who are unable to follow along today, you can also watch those videos. But those, the videos are not exactly on the whole content. It's only about uh, the lab sheet. Actually, it's actually walking you through the lab sheet. So I'm really doing the lab sheet in this video. You can follow me along as well. But today, what we're going to do is to actually go through the slides. And 
your job today with me, for those, especially for those who raise their hand, is to follow the hands-on part. Just like just now we run an, uh, a Hello World program, you're going to run a, a bunch of smaller programs to make sure that you are uh, follow along, yeah, that you fully understand what's going on. Okay, so let's talk about your program. The Hello World program that we run just now actually contains a number of elements that you need to learn. First of all, let's take a look at this line right here. This right here is a library. So the very first thing, if you go to the, the slides and you go to here, this is the context. We're gonna talk about C++. We already talked about the about part, which is the theory part. We already did the, the getting started, which is the installation and hello world. And then we're gonna go through the syntax, variables, input, user input, operations, logical operating loops and function, all of that we will do today and next week, as well as libraries and uh, exercises, okay? Now, if you wanna skip all the way to the end, uh, or the, the tasks and uh, the, the functions will be later on. The exercises will be on Moodle. So, um, so basically, uh, this is what we're gonna be covering today. As you can see, one of the concepts is library. And you actually already work with a library. By the way, if you're wondering why my, 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 uh, my genie is dark and yours is bright, is because I like the dark mode. And uh, you can go to preferences, editor, and display, and change the color. I think I, what is it, huh? Displays. Where did I choose the theme? I forgot. General. Miscellaneous. I generally forgot where I will. Later on, when I remember, I'll let you know yeah, where I put my, uh, where I use, or how I set up the dark mode. Because I don't like the bright screen when I code. It's too bright, it hits my eyes. So I like to use the, the dark screen. Compilation features. Maybe it's not here. Maybe it's in project. Oh, yeah. Properties. No, not here. Project. View. Ah, here. You go to view, change color scheme, and then you can choose the color scheme. This is the default one. It's too bright for my eyes. It hits my eyes all the time. You can choose another one, and you can choose Vaspin for the dark. You can even go for even darker. Uh, if you want, it depends on your uh, preference. I prefer this one. It's good for me. So you can actually choose the different color theme according to your preference. Okay, so uh, again, let's talk about the content or the components of the program. This is a library. This is how you include a library. And uh, this is another way of using a library, but you're using specific parts of the library. See here, we are actually uh, using the whole IO stream or input output stream. But over here, we are also gonna be using STD or standard from the same library. So this way, we're gonna be using it for to be able to do this. With that, this line right here, this is going to cause a problem. In fact, you can test it right now if you want. If you do uh, this, this line right here, that would be a, co a comment. If you try to compile now, you're gonna, you might get an error. Yep, here we go. So that's a problem right now. Compilation failed. Now, if you remember what I told you earlier about compilation uh, or error codes, that's actually telling you exactly what the problem is. Compilation fails, and it's telling you um, you don't know what you're talking about. C out hello world was not declared. I don't know what C out is. Because I removed this, it no longer recognizes this command. So that's why uh, you need this guy right here. So in the future, if you see this kind of error not declared in this scope, that means you you didn't include a library or your library is missing. Compile again, we're good to go. Now let me purposely create an error, like putting uh, this guy right here. Compile again. Uh, oh wait, it says, oh wait, there's a variable name. Uh, 
that actually will work. Let's come and do this here. Uh, notice when I change this, like, even the color changes, is that right? This is one of the fundamental great things about IDEs, is that you can actually see the, the error happening as you type, because the word using is a special word, and therefore it has its own special um, color. Give me another example. If I type F for the F statement, you can see that the color also changes, but if I type F for capital or capital I, but small letter F, you still have, or the other way around, you can see that there is no color coding here. It only works if they are both small letters. I hope now you see how the color coding is really, really powerful to help you type your, your, your code properly. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, we talked about what is C++ and the history of it was in the 70s or late 70s. And it was the most power popular, I think, uh, I don't think it's popular, but the most used application or program. We did this already, the Hello World. And now uh, we did the build and compile and execute step. We did this step already, which is compiling in Hello World. And this slide right here contains the explanation of what's going on. Library, uh, namespace, and then uh, basically a uh, function and we use the command and so on. You know what, there's something I wanna show you here uh, in, the, in the program. This right here is a function. Uh, it's called the main function. It, it's purposed to run the program. But what I want you to see is this guy right here. This guy right here is, you know what, maybe this comes later, but it comes later. Let's talk about this later. Let's talk about, um, what comes actually next? <clears throat> uh, well, of course, the syntax, every C++ statement starts with a semicolon, uh, ends, sorry, with a semicolon. Start a new line, you'll need to use the, the new character. I think this is for the comment or for the text, not for the actual programming code. Uh, next is this. Okay, the very first thing you should learn about any programming language is how do you write a comment? Um, uh, this program right here is good and all, but it does not have any explanation. If you want to add a comment, all you have to do is add a back, back, backslash, a backslash, or twice. <clears throat> then you can write whatever you want, really, whatever you want. And nothing is gonna happen. You run the program, it's still going to run, and it's still going to compile, and it's still going to execute. That's because a comment, this comment right here, will be ignored by the compiler. Whatever you put here will be completely ignored by the compiler. It's not part of the program. So if it's not part of the program, then what's the purpose of the, of the comment? Actually, the comment is extremely powerful to you as a developer. It helps you explain what's going on with the program, okay? Add the IO stream library, okay? Or if you want to be more specific, you can say input output stream library. So you can actually add a little bit of description for yourself. You can also add more comments here to what's going on. If, if you want, you can add a comment on every line but sometimes this is too much. Sometimes you would want to add a comment before a function, like what does this function is doing? So purpose, uh, the main function uh, runs the same pro the main program, the, the program, okay? So explain to you what's going on. And by the way, um, you can actually also explain what is this. Sometimes you don't understand what's going on, you can put a note for yourself. What is this is like a sort of a reminder for yourself. And then later on, you can come back. You can go and Google it or study it or ask around and something like that. And then you can answer it and you can replace it with the answer. So the comments are a very, very powerful tool for your learning to, in order to learn what's going on. And in fact, the comments is also one of the areas I'm going to use to, to, um, to evaluate your work. If your program is written nicely and all, but it does not have enough comments to describe what's going on, 
then uh, you might lose monks. Let me uh, open up recent files. Uh, yeah, why not? You know, no, until. Why is it not open? Uh, let me try and find uh, some of my earlier programs or other programs. Uh, desktop. Oh, okay, difficult to open from here. But anyway, uh, later I'm going to show you other examples with and with and without code. It will actually be helpful for you to to do this program. Also, another reason why comments would be very powerful is because if you work with a teammate. If you work with a people, other people on a project, then the comments will describe what's going on to, to the other people. Maybe you would work with other people on their work. Uh, on, you know, maybe you want to complete their own work. So this way you can then uh, read their comments, understand what they were trying to do, and then uh, make sense to, to you. Also, another thing you can do is that you can read their comments and hopefully understand what they were trying to do. And then, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the next item. Uh, this, this is why one of the earliest things uh, I do is a comment. If you want to write a block or a large volume of comment, uh, you don't want to write uh, 17 different lines of this. Let's say if I want to do another comment here. This is not a comment. If I run this program now, we're going to get an error because we're not going to recognize this part. So if you have a lot of comments and you want to add multiple lines of comments, you can either do this right on every line, or you can just do this. Put a star here, and on the last line you put a star here. So this way, this has become a block. And this way now, you can write whatever you want. Now this, all of this is a is a comment, and you can actually close it as well if you want. You can write things like introduction, or you can write about this program and stuff like that. Okay. So these are the uses of the comments. Okay, next. Comes the next part or the next important part about any programming language, which is variables. And variables is basically the gist of our programming purpose, especially when it comes to sensors. Let's say if you have sensors, so capturing sensor data, we will have to save those values in variables. If you are trying to use IoT, then the data that you're going to broadcast to the cloud is also variables. Uh, if you would like to capture user input, then once again, this will have to be a variable. So whatever you want, a lot of things you have to do with the project, with the program will be a variable. So the type of variables that you have are the following. You have an integer. I'm going to come here and change the color here. Integer, uh, you have a double, which is an integer, of course, things like seven, three, whatever, negative four, anything without a decimal. Um, a double is essentially is a float. Uh, by the way, we also have a float as another variable. Uh, or float. Uh, that stored a floating number of points, uh, which are decimals, basically. And we have a char, which is a character, which is a single, tech, a single uh, character. Just one letter or one symbol, nothing else. Because if you have more than one, then it's no longer a car, a character, it's essentially a string. And finally, uh, we could have a Boolean uh, or bool. Boolean essentially is the logic, uh, true or false. Uh, you could store a condition, like if something is true or something is false, then you can save that condition, whether it's, uh, we call that Boolean or bool. Okay, I have a question, and uh, this question is for a bonus point. Um, did I explain the bonus point or not yet? Uh, some of you might know me already from other courses, or maybe some of you heard about me from other courses. But what I would like, what I always like to do is to give bonus points and bonus marks. And the way the bonus mark works is essentially a bonus mark is a carry mark. So if let's say you, if you go back to our course outline, eventually when it opens, okay, and you can see you have assignments, 10%, you have lab sheets, 
you have midterm and you have the project. There is something else here, but it's not written here. It's sort of hidden. And that is the bonus point. The bonus point is at any time during the semester, whether it's during class, assignment, lab, whatever, right? I will ask a question, a special question, and then I will announce it up front. I will say this question is for a bonus point. And if you answer it correctly, you will gonna get an extra mark on your carry mark. So let's say if you got a, if you answered correctly and you won the bonus point, you're gonna get an extra carry mark. So let's say you did 10% uh, and 20% here. Let's say you got 30% out of 60, example, right? And then you answer the bonus point, you get 31. You can get as many bonus points as you want, as long as you are making and you answer this correctly. So let's say you collected five bonus points at the end, by the end of the semester, you're gonna get extra 5% from me. This is on top of everything else here. So you can use this opportunity to improve or fix your, assign your marks in case you, 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 know, you messed up one assignment or you, you, things didn't go well in, in, the term, in the midterm or something like that. And this gives you an opportunity to improve your candy marks. So once again, at any time during the semester, could be here, could be during, or it could be in a telegram group, could be in an assignment, or in during the, the, the project or something like that. I would ask a question or more, and I will tell you that this question is for a bonus point, sometimes for two or even three. Meaning one question, you get two bonus points, or one question, you get three bonus points, something like that. And then the first person to answer it correctly gets the point, okay? Uh, so I hope that concept is clear. So based on that, now we go back to the slide. And now I do have a bonus point question. And my question right now, and it's worth one bonus point. The first person to answer this question will get that point. What is the difference between double and float? Once again, if you want to answer this question, unmute yourself and ask. Go ahead. And ask. Yes, uh, what is the difference between double and float? The difference is double can only up to two decimal point and float uh, infinite decimal points. I think. Um, nice try, but uh, no. Um, but close. You are close to the answer, but not uh, not correct. Yeah. Anyone else? Did you say me? Uh, who, uh, are you? I mean, I mean, Sufi, right? Go ahead. Yes. Sir. Do you want to answer? Uh, yeah, I try answer. Please go ahead. You lose nothing of trying. Integers is for numbers only without decimal. Okay. But float or double can have up to two decimal. I think the, you did not capture the, the question correctly. I was asking what is the difference between double and float? There is a difference between them. I wasn't asking the difference between double and integer, but thank you for trying. Anyone else? Um, so, who is it? Who is it? Kiran. Uh, go ahead. Double has 15 decimal digits and okay. float has seven de decimal digits. Let me ask you an answer honestly. Did you Google the answer? Yes, sir. Well, no problem. I accept it, even if you Google it. Uh, Thank you, sir. You, you get the point. So, uh, well, I need your phone. Uh, make sure you uh, type your name or at least your student ID in the chat area. All right, sir. Congratulations. By the way, I have no problem if you use Google to find the answer because you are going to use Google a lot this semester. But the answer to the question is uh, yes, these two numbers, they both have decimals. Let's get that out of the way. But the difference is, is that double has a lot more decimal points. Uh, the float has only about seven or eight decimal points, less decimal points. But uh, the double has a lot more. That's why it's called a double, because it's actually double the amount of the float. So what's the big deal? The big deal is if you have a number and you want it to be super accurate, you use a double so that you have a lot more decimal points for accuracy. But if you are happy with just seven decimals, then you can use a float, okay? So either way, uh, this is the purpose. Now, you might be thinking seven decimals, and it's still not enough. Actually, for some applications, seven decimals is indeed not enough. So uh, hopefully now the point is clear. What is the difference between float 
and double. Okay, Nirosh, what do you want? Let me read your comment. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, let me tell you guys, I have no issues with using Google to answer the question. Uh, even during the test, for the fall, I care. As long as you answer it correctly, done. Uh, in this day and age, using online resources is definitely recommended. As long as you answer the answer, you provide the correct answer when needed. Okay. Uh, and yes, for future bonus points. If, okay, so uh, Google first. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, no problem by me. But as long as you, after you Google the answer, uh, make sure you Google the correct answer. So you never, it's not always correct, yeah. But also uh, after. You you Google it and you know it, make sure you comment out the, the results. Uh, slow internet. Um, sorry, I cannot help you with that, guys. I'm sorry about that. Okay, let's carry on. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, okay, apart from using the internet, uh, guys, you don't have to use the internet. All you have to do is use my slides. Most of the time, I ask questions that, uh, that um, most of the times when I ask a bonus point question, for example, maybe this one. Was not there, but sometimes I ask a question here and the answer is already here. You get what I mean? Meaning, I would basically I put a question in this slide, but the answer to the question is actually coming up in the next couple of slides. You get what I mean? So, if you actually studied ahead of me, if let's say before the start of the session, you went through the slides and you sort of reviewed the slides before the session, then you will be ready. Because when I come to the point of the question, you already know the answer. And then without the internet. So therefore, you can then uh, you have a better chance of answering and getting the bonus points. So, Tishan, um, like I said, um, I apologize. I'm sad. I really cannot help with about the internet. But then again, you can use the, the online resources such as the slides and other terms and prepare before the session starts. OK, so let's get back to valuable. OK, now let's talk about something important and is very important when it comes to C++, which is declaring a variable. Uh, I want to go to Jimmy right now, and I want to do something here. Uh, let's say uh, uh, name equal I mean, I want to do this right now, and then of course, semicolon. And Actually, don't remember if this is going to work or not. Uh, print. You know what? I forgot the syntax. I'm going to go. I'm going to Google the, the syntax. What is the print? You know what? I don't even know what is it here. So I'm going to look for it even in Google. So print C. If ever you forgot a uh, syntax or any kind of feature, just use, and it's right in W3 school, but it will point you directly to where it is. So, oh, there's no print. There's only a key out. Oh, this is what happens when you work in multiple languages all the time. You get confused with the syntax sometimes. Okay, so fine. I'm going to use key out, but I'm going to go back to Genie. I'm going to try to write key out. Not tell a word anymore, but I'm going to write name. So what you have here is that you should be able to, oh, you know what? I'm going to put hello world here. Hello world. Yeah. And then, by right, this should work. Uh, basically, instead of putting the hello world here, I put it in a variable called name. And then I put the, the variable right here. And then I basically print it. So what I expect to happen is that when I run this program, I should still see Hello World. I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'm gonna change it back to Hello World uh, from a variable. From a variable. Okay. But just to make it different, because this is a variable. Okay. And then by right, this should work. We should see a print statement that says Hello World from a variable. But before I run this program. Do you think it's going to work? Uh, this is one of those, uh, this is another skill or another thing you should do all the time. When you're writing code, you should actually, before you run the code, you should try to see or try to anticipate what is going to happen. If it happens, 
if what you anticipated actually happened, then you are okay. That means your your understanding or your logic, or, it's fine. You're following exactly okay. But if it didn't happen, then you know something is wrong, and you have to go back and fix it. So let me show. Let me see. Uh, show of hands. You guys think this will work? Well, I can tell you right now that this will not work. We're gonna get an error. But let's just give it a try. So compile, and here we go. Error right there and then. You can see actually that the word name is not even recognized. You know what I mean? Um, it says that name is not recognized because what's going on here is that the declaration in here did not work. By the way, uh, I want to show you something. We have two errors actually. There is a message. Don't we have to use print F? Yes, you're right, by the way. But uh, print F uh, later. Uh, I want to use C also now. Yeah, I want to use C now. So print F name and semicolon. Okay, let's comment this guy out. Okay. And he's still going to get even more errors now. Uh, expected semicolon. Yeah. Because because the point I, I wanted to make here, before we talk about the print F or something else, notice how many errors guys we have. We have now a bunch of errors, like four or five errors, but I only modified one line. That's because the, the source of the problem is this line right here. If you fix this problem or you fix the first error, everything else will be fine. The problem in here is that in C++, when you declare a variable, you would have to declare two things. First of all, you have to declare the type as well as the name of the variable. You see, in Genie just now, I did not declare the type. I just write name and then I put the value. Is that right? The problem with C is that C does not know the context or does not know what type of variable are you declaring here. I know, I know, and you, you know as well that this is actually a string. If you look at this now, you can tell that this is actually a string. You can see it, I can see it, but the compiler does not see it. The compiler doesn't work this way. In order for the compiler to work, it has to know that this is actually an str or string. Uh, how do you call a string? Um, um, I never memorized uh, syntax, so if you are, oh, it's just a string, okay. I never memorized syntax, so if you're laughing right now, saying, oh, he made a mistake. I love all you want because I didn't have to memorize anything. In fact, let's double check here. Variables, uh, syntax of variables, right? So variables, string, if I want to declare a string, so integer, yeah, it's just the word string. But I'm not sure for some reason it's not color coded. Maybe Jenny does not recognize the word string here. So string name, let's see if this works. We're still getting errors, right? Am I missing something? Uh, let's put this out for a minute. I think I need, I need, I need to do a library for print F, right? So, do that way. And see out here. Successful. I think in order to use print F, I have to include something else. I forgot what it is. Um, it's been a while I used C, actually. So once again, if I remove this only, if I just put the variable name only, then I get an error because C does not know what type of variable is this. But if I put string, then C actually would recognize what's going on and then it will work. Then compile successful, build successful, and then execute and hello world from a variable. It did work. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, you know what? Uh, I am actually now uh, not happy. So let's go ahead and see this. So print f c++ example. Ah, oh, you have to uh, you have to include the stdio right, and also the, this other library as well. We'll come to that later. But for now, I think uh, this uh, input output or io stream is fine for now. But print f, you know, if you want to use it, you'll have to include another library. You'll have, like I like I said. Okay, so. The point of this, what I'm talking about right now, is that the fact that in C++, you have to declare a variable and you have to declare a, a 
uh, sorry, the variable name uh, plus you have to declare the the type, the variable type. You don't have to use the word name, you can just say statement, for example. And then down here, you have to come back and say this is state. Name. All right, do you see this? This is another lovely thing about IDEs that it knows that you have a variable already called statement, so it's going to auto complete for you. So you just have to do it this way. Okay. Again, compile, we're good to go, successful, build, successful, and then execute, we're good to go. Now, earlier in the, in the slides, I did, uh, now, by the way, uh, this behavior, you know, the variable type, uh, if you want, I can do this. Type, name, and then value, okay? Uh, nobody about the X plus C plus plus is okay with it. Okay, even if I do this, by the way, it's still gonna work. Compile, step, and build, and it's gonna run because C plus plus ignores those X plus C. But for clarity, you can do this if you want. I will just bring it back the way it was. It's fine. So this is a name, and this is value. Okay. Uh, if you want, you can say variable, variable settings, or variable, yeah, uh, declaring variable, yeah, declare variable. Okay, so do we have to declare all the variables before we start coding, or can we do it along the way? Very good question, and the answer to, it, to that is that it's recommended to do it beforehand or as early as you can in the program. And I know what you're thinking now. Sir, I cannot think of all the variables that I'm going to need before I write the program. You're right. As soon as you think of a new variable or you come up with a new variable, just go back up and declare it in the very beginning as far as possible. It's a good practice that in your program, right, that you have a sort of a zone, I call them. Let's get rid of this thing. Uh, in the zone, uh, what I mean by zone is that here we have one zone, and this one is for library. So, right? And then it's a good idea or a good practice that you have another zone for um, variables, and then another one later on maybe for functions. In C++, you have to put the functions as high as possible before you actually use them. And then finally, you can then put the main. Okay, it's a good idea that you always uh, divide your program into these zones here. So this way you have everything organized for you and for everybody else working with you. However, to be honest with you, if you declare the variables, say, let's say you, you come somewhere here and you clear another variable here, that's fine. That will still work, by the way. You know what I mean? But it's not a good practice because you sometimes uh, you might never you might never know you might need this actually somewhere above here for a function or something so it's a good practice to avoid the headaches as i call them right to declare them as high as possible okay um, thanks uh thanks for this question uh, this is a good time to talk about scope variable scope no maybe Okay, so now uh, let's continue with the slide. So, uh, so once again, I hope you guys remember this part, which is type variable and then value or variable name, fun, and so on and so forth. Okay. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, what's next? These are the exact, excuse me, examples of how you can actually uh, work or declare several values. Integer. Double or float if you want, car for, or char if you'd like to call it that way, and string and boolean. Notice how string and boolean they do not change colors. I don't know why, but that is the case. Um, boolean is uh, a different kind of variable, which is a true or false. And once again, notice that it's a small letter or capital letter. Uh, integer is uh, with no decimals, and double or float is. Um, with decimals, char or car is one single character, and uh, string is text 
it's going to turn and so on and so forth. Displaying variables. Okay, you can definitely, what you can do is you can also use C out to, to display the variables in the way here. Um, if you want, you can actually come and do this. Uh, you can say, my name is, and then here, you can ask another uh, name. So, my name. Okay, I then, um, name. This will look weird, but actually, uh, no, 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 wait, sorry. My name is name, and then, uh, name space. Yeah, nice to meet you. Okay, so that's basically my problem. I can come here now and say uh, my name, and then over here, I'm going to say Sunny. Okay. So what's going to happen right now is that uh, you don't want to clear all of this extra stuff. So what's going to happen here uh, is that the, I declare the variable called my name, which is right here, and then I'm going to display the output. And the output is going to be a combination of three things, which is this bar, right, this string, combined with my name, which is this guy right here, and then added to it this part. And yeah, okay, compiled. Successful, build successful, and run. And my name is Sami Hajjaj. Nice to meet you. Okay, maybe you should not put a capital letter after this. Let me call it after a comma, but it's fine. What happened here? All right, close to me. Okay. Uh, if you would like to zoom in and out, by the way, just hold the control button and roll the mouse. The mouse has a roller, is that right? Then click on the control and roll the mouse. You can zoom in and out. You can actually. Okay, well, let's move on. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to talk about operations. And uh, I know you know basic math. And I, I know I'm sure that you know uh, basic addition and subtraction. But then again, I want to show you something that sometimes C does not always do math the way you do it. Sometimes it does what is called concatenation. Or con basically, it combines two strings together. So if I take integer five, for example, if you look at this program right here, with this snippet right here, you can see that integer x five, integer y is there x, uh, six. So basically, we, de we declare two variables. We declare the third variable called sum, which is equal to x plus y, and then I would like to de de display the output, which is sum. The output obviously will be the summation of five and six. Okay. Uh, we can do that very quickly here. We can actually come and say uh, and. Five x equal to five, comma y equal to six. Uh, yes, you can do multiple declaration in one shot. Um, wait a minute. Do you have to put int again here? Uh, I don't think so because the int is already mentioned here. Um, um, let's just try and see. Uh, actually, even um, you can put sum as well with them, but I try to do it in a separate line. So sum will be x plus y. Okay, and. Um, the summation is, and then you can put sum. And you know what? I'm going to keep this part right here. <laughs> nice to meet you. So the summation is, and this is compile. Successful build, successful, and then run. The summation is 11. Nice to meet you. So here we go. So 5 plus 6 is 11. We're good to go. Now, I want to show you something else. Um, what if I did this? Will it work? Again, I get what is called uh, variable type error. Variable type error. I think it's written somewhere that you're going to get a uh, variable type error. Because you write a string, but you over here you put an integer. So obviously, that's not going to work. You have to make sure that you put correct variable type. Compile, look at the But what if I do this? Uh, And then I'll put string. What do you think is going to happen now? Do you think this will work and why not? Oh, five and six, and then summation of five and six. Or can you expect what is going to happen? First of all, this line will work. Go ahead. 
So you would like to participate? If you would like to answer the question, go ahead. What do you, what do you think is going to happen? Hey, hey, don't run the program and then tell me what happened. <laughs> and five and six. Uh, besides, besides this, under fifty-six. Uh, uh, Five, six. You mean it's going to concatenate? Is that right? Well, uh, yes. I'm not sure if you run the program or not, but I think we're going to get an error. But let's just give it a try. He's saying that we're going to get fifty-six or five next to. It's going to be concatenated. Uh, what else? What other people are saying? Uh, please, guys. Uh, no problem. Uh, please, guys, when you uh, when I ask you to anticipate, don't run the program. Uh, that defeats the point. You need to test yourself. That's how you actually learn or become better at programming. When you try to anticipate something, and then whatever you anticipate happens. So that means you were actually learning. Wait, what happened to Jimmy? Okay, so if I actually, I, I'm basically anticipating an error, but let me give it a try. Oh, here we go, an error. Uh, actually, what happened was is that the error wasn't here. This worked because these two are strings. But the problem happened here is because you cannot convert blah, blah, blah. Basically, what's going on is that this is an integer, but you'd like to, uh, you, you are already telling me that the summation is an integer, but you're adding two strings. Okay? So that's why it didn't work. So in this case, what can we do to fix this? Any suggestions how to fix it? I would like to fix it. I would like to see an output. Change integer to what? Maybe. Hey, maybe in this, bring it back the way it was. No, no, no. I would like to see 56. I want to see 56 in the end. So how do I fix it? Change into string, maybe? Yes, actually, you're right. So, well, at least let's give it a try. So basically now we're saying that this is going to be a string. And check this out. Would it work? It works, but at least to see the output. And here we go. Well, obviously, the summation of 5 and 6 is not 56, it's 11. But then what's going on here is that this is now an example of a program that is running correct and that is running. There's no error, but it's not doing the job that you wanted it to do. I know that this is a very obvious example. But then again, uh, this is an example of a program that is not doing what you want it to do. You want it to add 5 plus 6, but it's not actually doing that. It's concatenating 5 and 6. So in this way, there is no error code. There is no uh, message telling you where the problem is. Unfortunately, you may have to go back and read the code and try to find where the problem is. In our example, it's a simple program. With a couple of lines, and therefore it's easy to trace. But if you had like something like a 50 lines or 50 output lines or more than that, it's going to be a challenge. So the way to fix this is simple. We have to go back and put integer here. And, and by the way, um, there is another way, by the way. Um, yeah. Um, what if I do this string? Oh yeah, um, yeah. Let's not do that. Okay. Uh, well, I was trying to show you something called casting, which is um, if you already declare the variable in a certain way, you want to change that declaration, then and we will see that later. So obviously, this will work now. I'm going to get 11 in the end, and here we go. So this works. Uh, okay. Now it's five o'clock. Let's go for a small break, and then we come back. And then we finish the session for today. Um, you can actually go through, uh, you can move ahead of me if you want, uh, if you'd like. But then uh, I'm going to take a five minutes break and then come back and we can continue with the session. Okay, see you in a bit.
Okay, welcome back, guys. Uh, the status is set. Oh, okay. Okay, so once again, I want to show you that the question that I asked about double, I think I asked here, is that right? Yeah, in slide number nine. And the answer is right here in slide number 14. And I will always do that. I will always, whenever I ask a bonus point question, that the answer is already there, just ahead. So if you would like to increase your chances of winning future bonus points, all you have to do is before the session starts, any session that is, excuse me. Hold on, yeah. Sorry, I was having a hiccup. Anyway, so all you have to do is to go, go through my slides before my session starts. The slides are already on Moodle all of them since the beginning of days. And all you have to do is before our usual sessions on Tuesdays or Fridays, right? Oh, wait a minute. The Friday people will have an advantage now. Um, well, good for them, I guess. But anyway, so you guys, actually you, you guys have the advantage because you, uh, the people on Tuesday, because by Friday, the, the question would have been a recorded one and people would have seen it already. Maybe I guess I'll ask them specific questions on Friday. So yeah, for the Friday sessions, I will ask them unique questions that don't come on Tuesday or different questions. I think that would be fair for everyone. But anyway, you, uh, even if the questions were on Friday different than the one on Tuesday, they will also be from the slides. I will not, most of the time, I will not include a question from outside. But even if I do include a question from outside, then that one will have even a bigger value. By the way, regarding bonus point questions, sometimes it's not just an answer. Sometimes it will be the quickest answer. For example, I could give a task, let's say, do this, this task. And then the first person to get it right or to, to do the task completely correctly will get the point. It's like a race. Maybe I will give you a small programming task, do this thing, write the program, do this thing. And the first person to get it right, then they will get the bonus point, something like that. You know what I mean? So, uh, yes, so it's either something already in the slides or something that is uh, depends on speed. So in this slide right here, we already saw this one, and this slide right here shows all the data types and their features. And uh, I already described, described this part, so I'm gonna move on. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to cover every one of those slides because some of them are uh, basically uh, copy-pasted from the W3 schools. But I'm gonna go through the important ones. Uh, you can definitely go through the, all of those slides in your own time. Oh, good. Let's talk about user input. Um, again, using C++ to capture user input is vital, uh, at, at least for our first lab sheet, because in your lab sheet, you will be required to ask the user to key in numbers. And therefore, you're going to have to take that input and then process it. And the way to do that is right here. So first of all, let's take a look at how this works. This is, by the way, a declaration of a value or a variable, but without value. If you go back here to variables, you can see that you declare a variable type and then the name of the variable and then the value. But you don't have to do that all the time. Sometimes you declare the variable without a, the value. The value will be assigned later on. So in this case, the variable, the value will be um, uh, null. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, null. So now what's going on here? We declared a variable called x, but it doesn't have any value yet. It just put it aside, something called x. And then we print out a statement that says uh, type a number. So we're just telling the user type a number. Then c out, this is how you read this part. Then c in essentially is to capture that input. When the user inputs the number, we gotta, what we're gonna do right here is that we're gonna capture whatever the user inputted and then we're going to take that value and then assign it to x. So I'm going to say that one more time. You know? First of all, you declare a variable called x, and you tell the compiler that it's an integer. But you don't give it any value, just x. Then you, you tell the user, user, please give me a number. Actually, this should be an integer, but let's just, let's just uh, deal with that later. So give me a number or type a number. Then the user will input them. In order for you to capture the user's input, you have to use cn. And notice how the arrows are different now, at the opposite direction. So what does this line do here is actually basically, it takes the user input, whatever the user input is, and then it will assign it to X. 
So now at this point, X is no longer a null, it has a value. What value? It's whatever the user has typed. Okay. And then, then what you can do after that is that you can display the output. You can say that the number you input it is, is this. Okay, let's do that actually ourselves. And by the way, when I say let's do that, I mean you let's do that. Uh, it's not just me doing it. By the way, um, I'm not sure if we still need this guy, the main function all the time. Uh, uh, maybe we do, okay. Uh, okay, so let's do this together. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna come back here and do uh, int x and uh, come down here and say, uh, the output, okay, copy this line and then B, control C, control D, yeah? and then change this uh, to whatever you want. Uh, please enter an integer. integer. Okay. Okay, so that's the first line. So if you remember from, uh, what is it? Uh, out, what is that? Ah, uh, here. Oh, what did it go? Okay. Not here either. Uh, not, why am I? Alt tabs don't work now. Hide. What did that? Oh, here. Uh, actually, it's not here either. It's in my slides. Okay, it's right here. So, Jenny, Jenny, where are you? Jenny? Yeah, here. So basically what I want is to get the CN, right? So then you'll take the CN value and you assign it to X. Okay, so fine. So we come back here, right? And we do uh, CN. And then the arrow is opposite direction and then we put it close to X. That's all we have to do. So what's going on here is that you ask the, the guy to input a value, then you ask, you capture that value and then you display it. So you entered, and then we throw away this stuff right here and we put X. Uh, yeah, leave this here. <laughs> this is funny actually to leave it here. Okay, compile, hopefully. No oh, we have a problem. Oh, sorry, uh, I still have this other stuff here. Let's throw it away. I don't need all of this right now. Oh, you know what? Let's put it in a comment box. Uh, right. Oh yeah, it's complaining that I have X twice, but right now or after this, it's gonna be fine. Uh, if you if you're wondering what was the cause of the error, is because I declared uh, X two times. If you declare X, or if you declare a variable once, you cannot declare it again. Otherwise, you're gonna get an error. You know what? Let's take a look at that again. So I just put this guy here and this guy here. So what's going on here is that I declared x equal to five, and then I came back here and I declared it one more time. And that is going to cause an error because now it says x has previously defined, has already been previously defined. And look how useful the, the IDE is. It actually shows you where that has happened. So you don't have to suffer, look for it, get it? So I'm gonna hide this one. So now we're gonna be no complaints. Run it again, we're good to go. So compile build, and then run, and please enter your integer, uh, five. You have entered five, have a nice, nice to meet you. Okay, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I don't like the way that the five was right there. Oh, what is this, uh, where's my, okay, let's run again. I don't like how the five is right here. I want to have some space, right? And when I click here, there's, so everything is glued and straight away together. So I don't like that. So I'm gonna actually give some space and put this. This means that whatever comes after this is gonna be in a new line. And uh, let's try and see what happened now. Compile, build and execute again. So now the five is actually typed in the next line, not in here. So five, you have entered five, nice to meet you, thank you. You know what, let's, let's, this is annoying. Have a nice day. Okay, so what happens if I don't enter an integer, if I entered something else? Well, let's see. 
What if I put uh, Sammy? What do you think is going to happen? Once again, guys, I don't want you to just answer me. I want you yourself to think about it for a second and try to see what is going to happen. See, if I put it this way, if this was the situation, and you, instead of entering an integer, you actually type a text, what is going to happen? Okay? Think about it for a second. You don't have to answer me. Just think about it for a second. Try to guess something or guess an outcome. And then try not to be too general. Don't say an error. We all know error is error, but try to see what is the actual error. Try to anticipate it. If you are able to do this, like to, pr to predict what your program is going to do and you predict it correctly over time, you're going to develop a skill where you won't be able to read code. This is actually a very powerful skill when it comes to programming. You read code, you understand what's going to happen even without running it. I'm not sure if you would watch the movie called The Matrix and the guy was looking at the code and doesn't have to see the things anymore. He can read the green stuff. Well, you can actually develop that skill here by simply reading the code and then Try yourself to build the logic just like the compiler and see, predict what's going to happen. And I'm going to tell you right now what I think is going to happen. I declare this as an integer, but then when I actually give it a string, it might give me an error saying that this is the wrong variable type. I'm guessing that this is going to happen. But nevertheless, it's still going to display it because this is going to display anyway, regardless. So I'm not sure it's going to be an error. It might be a warning. So let's take a look. Please enter an integer. Oh, by the way, uh, notice, by the way, um, actually, the compiler did not succeed. See, compiler here successfully. Let's see the build. And now we're having an error in the build. Notice one thing, guys. Even though that we have an error in the build, and I can still run the program, not a problem. But still, we're going to get a problem. So if I write here, Sammy, uh, wait a minute. Uh, this did not happen before. Uh, I think this is a warning. Cannot open. Oh, I think because I already have another instance of the program running. Uh, yeah. So let's close that again. Uh, that kind of that kind of warning happens when you're running multiple instances. So okay. So this is the the, the program. If I actually run this now, um, basically the program runs, but it doesn't run at all. It gives you zero. I obviously did not enter a zero. So if, if you might be thinking, sir, the program ran, no error. Yeah, but it, the behavior of the program is not accurate. It should give you an error. It should tell you, hey, you did not enter an integer. I asked for an integer, you typed a text. So this is not a good behavior. You should have a program that does exactly what you want. If the user gives you an int does not give you an integer, you should be able to correct it or at least give the user a warning. Hey, user, I said integer, not a text. So you have to be able to do what is called uh, very, um, uh, verifying or um, uh, double checking. I forgot the, the word for that. Okay, so, but what really happened here is that, yes, I gave you a, a string, but the string was not, has any value. So this was not, did not work because CN is supposed to be X, X is supposed to be uh, an integer, but you give it a string, it didn't work. So the assigned, it was not assigned. So what you printed was, was the empty thing that you did here. So I'm gonna explain again what really happened. You, you started by declaring this variable. Then you ask the user to input an integer. You, the user did not input an integer. Instead, it give you a string. The string cannot be assigned to an integer. So this step right here failed, failed. And because it failed, we don't have any value assigned to X. So therefore, when you come out here and print X, it will print the original one you have here, which has no value. And how do you print no value? Empty. What is empty number? Zero. You get me? Uh, somebody will be arguing, sir, zero is a value, and you're absolutely correct. But when it comes to actually just printing out, you cannot print a none or NAN or not an integer or something like that. It will print a blank. Okay? Uh, validation, the word I was looking for. So what do you want right now is that you want some form of a way to validate this answer. Validate user input. Validate means what? You want to make sure that, you want to make sure user actually inputted 
an integer. That's what you want. That's what you mean by validation. Without validation, then nothing is going to happen. Nothing is going to work. Validation is, is with us throughout. Uh, without validation, none of, no, no program will ever run correctly. It will always have errors and, and unpredictable behavior. So here we want an integer. Why? That's it. And that's my business. I want an integer. So we have to make sure that the user does the validation. And we will discuss validation next week because we're running out of time today. Um, actually, the, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to do next week is I'm going to go through the, the, the lab sheet. But for now, um, let's not do that right now. OK, so let's carry on with the slides. So hopefully by now you captured or figured out or learned how to capture user input and at the same time how to display it and also show it. Other operations other than uh, addition, we have subtraction, multiplication, division, but only uh, these, the first two will actually apply to string as well. These two will not actually work on string. So you might want to uh, practice with this or you know, experiment with this. Uh, increment, which is plus plus and minus minus, uh, basically is this. Uh, this is equivalent to x uh, equal to x plus one. Um, uh, so what are you doing? What are you talking about? Uh, you want us to do that right now. So I'm going to actually do this right now. So x equal to 5, OK? And I'm going to pause or put this on hold for a second. And I'm going to print x, OK? Uh, if I do this right now, obviously, we're going to see a 5 here. Is that right? Well, let's do that. Just for fun sake, I want to show something. So around the program, you entered 5. OK, good. Now, what happens if I do this? x equal to x plus 1. Uh, when you think about this in algebra, or in regular mathematics, this is, does not make any sense. OK? But if I run this in, in uh, right now, if I run this program, it will work just fine. Can somebody tell me what will be the value here? Just type it if you don't want to talk. Can somebody tell me, if I actually run this program, what are we going to get? It will keep adding 1, and you're going to get 6. Absolutely correct. So let's do that. Uh, we got an error, actually. So what happened here? Uh, somebody said 6. Um, am I missing something? X does not, does not name a type. This is not, um, what's going on here? Really, does not work in C? Um, I guess this does not work anymore. Oh my God. Oh, the library. I have to include math. Okay, so I have to include the math library. So, God, how do you do that? Uh, include math C++. Yes, I definitely um, math.h. Thanks a lot. But I also wanted to show how to do this. So include that. So it's right here. So um, the point of this is not about the math only, but to show you that you don't have to memorize code. Definitely, you can use the internet to your advantage if you forgot syntax. And definitely, you can use Google. So yeah, that was the point of this exercise. Look so out here and include the middle library. So now CMAP is in. So if this works now. Error. Um, am I doing it wrong? Let's see this again. The operator is this. How about now x equal to x plus one? Yes. I guess this does not happen anymore. So uh, am I missing something? Somebody help? No, not this. It's, oh wait, uh, this plus plus increment is not an assigned value. It's just an operational. Uh, Increment. So you do that during an F when you're looping something. 
Okay, so, uh, but I still want to do that. I want to do the incremental thing. Why do we do that? So let's go back here. So example increases the increment. So operator is this. You know what? I forgot how to do this. Let's use our best friend, Uncle Google. So uh, increment in C++. Go. And here we go. So increment. And by the way, tutorials point is also an awesome example. It should work, right? In fact, they are telling you right now that this is what I wrote earlier is exactly the same, right? What am I missing here? So you can see that the first example that I wrote here is exactly the same as the way of which I also wrote there as well. So why is it not running? So, and let me try again. Tutorials point is also another great place to, to get to land stuff. So make sure you pick it up. Did I miss something here? Okay. But I already assigned it. Are we uh, using something else from above here? No, right? Um, I don't think this is it's already an error. I don't think it's going to work. Yeah, it's already declared. Uh, yeah, this was previous problem. X does not name a type. I don't think it's this way, but um, check it out. That is weird. That is absolutely weird. Am I missing something here? Uh, oh, I have to assign to another variable. Really? Okay, integer x equals five. Uh, integer y equal to plus x plus uh, plus plus x. Unbelievable. That was the problem. You cannot do that anymore. I guess I'm going to stop doing that in my future tutorials that it does not allow you to use the same variable again. I guess they already put it built in into the, into the compiler that you may not be able to do that. But then again, it's in the same page tutorials, right? It's already here. But maybe in a program, it's not possible to do this anymore. Because they're not doing it anymore, see? They're using one variable, and then they're using the other variable to do the increment anymore. That is weird. Well, anyway, uh, the, the point of this section right here is to show you how the increment works. And this is equivalent to x plus x plus, uh, plus one. Now, in the past, when this used to work, when we used to do this, uh, the point, actually, I really wanted um, to be. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, if you know something, let me know. What's up? Uh, so is there a difference between if, if you put um, plus plus x and x plus plus? No difference. Absolutely um, no difference. In oh, fact, okay. uh, they're both valid. It's just preference. Some people don't like to use this line. Maybe that's why it's no longer available. Some people prefer to do this, the, the plus plus. Absolutely, there's no difference between them. OK? I guess. Uh, you can clearly see it also here. This is exactly the same. Now, why would then uh, they would have two features? It's because uh, sometimes um, it's uh, we use this more often in loops or, or when we go through ranges. It's much easier to put this here. But if you put this in the loop or in the, this might be making the code a little bit more complex to see or you know, difficult to read. Uh, there's also the difference between this and this, by the way. Uh, the, 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 the fact that the increment is assigned. Oh, maybe this was the case. Try this. Yeah, still an error. Yeah, I'm not sure why this does not work anymore. 
But this is one of the early things you learn about programming. What I wanted to show you actually, or the point I wanted to make here is that x equal to x plus one, all right? This actually does not, uh, the, this symbol right here is not an equal sign. It's an assign sign. Now, what does that mean? It means basically you are taking the value or the variable x and you are assigning a new value, which is the old value plus one. What I'm trying to tell you that this right here is actually is not an equal sign. It is sign. Sign means I'm going to give it here, right here, we already use it as an assign. Uh, I declared the variable called x and then I assigned the value of five to it. I declare, I gave it this value. If you want to use the symbol as an equal sign, you have to use this. Uh, five is equal, equal, oh, sorry, A is equal, equal to X, all right? This simply means that the int, yeah, int A is equal to X, and now we can come down here and print A again. So hopefully that will work. So let's run this. Now, uh, this is only used in the F statement, not like this. So it's, this is still an assigned, uh, this is going to work, yeah. So obviously, you cannot process because uh, we, are, we have multiple instances, I guess. So let's run it again. Compile, build, and run. Okay. Uh, when do you actually use this? It's only during uh, in an if statement or when you are using a, a logic operator, like when you are checking if this is equal to this. Basically, you are asking that if these two are equal to each other, if that is the case, then do something. This is the only time where you use this equal equal. But if you want to use it as a simple, a single equal sign like this, then it's going to be an assign, which is this guy right here. Uh, also, not just an if statement, but also in the while loop. Because this is actually a, a status or a, or a condition, or in other words, a Boolean. If this is true, then go ahead and do something. Or if this is true or false, then go ahead and do something. Uh, today, I'm not going to go uh, overboard. Yeah, five minutes. Um, uh, five fifty. Another ten minutes. Then we stop. Okay. Uh, what's next? Uh, these are more operations. Uh, these are assignment operations. This is an equal, uh, this means assign uh, the value five to X, but this is also increment at the same time. So this is assign and increment. So this is actually plus equal three is equivalent to this again. So this is actually again an increment uh, to this. So the, uh, by the way, the difference between plus equal and plus plus, good question. Uh, what is the difference between um, X plus plus and x uh, plus equal three. Can somebody tell me what is the difference between these two? I think it's already in the slide. Yeah, it's right there in the slide. What is the difference between these two guys? Anyone jump in? Uh, if you are waiting for the bonus point, hey, go ahead. Uh, the amount of increments. Yes. This is actually equivalent to, thanks a lot, huh? This is equivalent to uh, X plus or plus, uh, what is it, plus? plus equal one. So this is actually equivalent to this. But of course, you can definitely you can write it like this if you want. But then why write extra characters? This is still working as fine. If you want to increment this by three, not by one, then you can actually define it here. You can also decrement and so on and so forth. So that's basically the, the increment and decrement values. You can also even increment multiplications, not just add or, uh, or subtraction. You can also decrement, you can also multiply, and you can even divide also uh, in increments as well. Uh, this is and equal and this is actually these are uh, these are less than or equal um, no these are different assignments right as well you are assigning values these are actually used for string operations when you actually print values and stuff like that uh 
Comparison operations. Oh, that's nice. This is A equal to, if A is equal, you are asking a question. Is A equal to B or X equal to Y? This is not, not equal. So if you ever saw this in chat before, sometimes when you are chatting with someone and they're using uh, this in the middle of the chat, that means not equal or not the same. Uh, this is usually coders or coding uh, lingo. Uh, greater or better, not better, better is only in, 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 in chat. So greater, less, and greater, and that, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, these are the logical operators, meaning uh, this right here is the same as and. This is and, this is or, and this is not. In Python, you can actually write it and, really in the English word and, you can actually use it. And or as well as not. These are all the same. Uh, and now, of course, in my slides, I only provide examples, but in um, in W3 schools, when they actually go through these things as well, or in W3 schools, when they go through these things like variables, type operations, for example, right? There is always an example or a small example. I would definitely and strongly suggest that you go through these as well. So assignment values and so on and so forth. You know what I mean? You can see the try it feature. So you can actually click on a try it. And you can actually you can come to a straight where a place where you have a small example on this feature and you run the program and this is the output. So if you actually run this program, you will see the output here. In fact, I want to try something here. Uh, I want to do this. Uh, can I change it? Change orientation, change team. Oh, we cannot edit this code, unfortunately. Uh, this is basically a one type, basically a, a program you can run and directly show the output. It does not allow you to edit, unfortunately. But I think other places will allow you to edit. So again, uh, not only look at these, and don't worry, by the way, you don't have to memorize any of this. Uh, the references are available online anywhere. Uh, if you forgot some sort of an assignment, you can always look it up. Um, what else? Uh, math, again, you can see the math operation, trigonometric operations. Uh, this is equivalent to tab inverse. Uh, uh, there's another one actually called A tab two. This one and A tab two. X and Y. You know what? I'll do this right now. Uh, okay, since I'm in a good mood, I'm gonna give you another bonus point question. This time, is it answered? No, it's not answered. What is the difference? And I, uh, let's be honest, guys. You know what? It's up to you. If you can, if you can find it, go ahead. So, what is the difference between A10 and A102? The first person to get it right, you'll get a bonus point. Go ahead. Once again, a bonus point question. Uh, what is the difference between A10 and A102? They are both tan inverse. They are both inverse tan. But then what is the difference between these two functions? Any takers? Everybody's good. Good, you're learning. Going once. I'll give you a... Uh, <coughs> Doing uh, so twice? Uh, you find it? <laughs> yeah. Um, Are you the same person who won the bonus point earlier? No, different guys. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, it, it depends on the quadrants that are in use when you're referring to the radians. Did you Google it or you, you're answering from your own mind? No, no, I Googled it. <laughs> Fine, go ahead, answer. Um, so it, it depends on the radians of the of the quadrants that the radians are in. So if only if you're only using on the x-axis, you use only A10. But then if you're using both the X and the Y, then use A10 too. No. Unfortunately, that's a wrong answer. No. So you see, Google is not always your best friend. <laughs> Anyone else? I really want to give bonus points. Anyone else? Uh, sir. Uh, did you win a bonus point earlier today? Yes, sir. So you don't qualify for this one. Sorry. 
once a day, oh. once a session. Sorry. Uh, you you can play again uh, in next class onwards, but in the in the same one session, uh, you don't qualify. You want I want to give turns to other people, unless Sir. nobody else answers. Okay, Niroj, go ahead. Uh, it then too allows us to calculate the arc tangent from all four quadrants, where only a ten allows us to calculate the quadrants from first and fourth quadrant. No. No, that's not it. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, both of them allow you to calculate from all of the quadrants, but the way they do it is differently. Any more? Any other takers? Okay, what is that guy just now that I said don't qualify? Nikronaj, right? Um, Kiron, I think. Kiron Rajkumar, right? If nobody else, since nobody else is taking the, the opportunity, you can go ahead and try. You're the last one. Go ahead. Kill or not? Did he run away? Looks like he left. Well, uh, since nobody is going to take this, uh, let me check. The... Uh, sir. Ah, you're here. You're back. Oh, is that you? Uh, it's just no. Oh, it's sir, this is okay, go kidding, ahead. Sir. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, A10 uh, gives the angle value between negative 90 to 90, and then A10 2 gives angle between negative 180 to 180. Are you reading this from Wikipedia? Um, not Wikipedia, but then but somewhere else, right? Google. Actually, yeah. no. Uh, that, what you said is okay, but still not the answer. I'll explain to you in a minute what, um, what I mean, what I'm talking about. Anybody else? Actually, I tried already three people. <clears throat> Unfortunately, no takers. Both of these two functions, a tan and a tan two, they both give you the inverse of the tangent. But the way they do it is different. In order for you to use a tan, you will have to, both of them actually, you will need to use cosine and sine. Is that right? So in order for you to find cosine, the tangent, right, you need the cosine of the angle and uh, let's say theta, right? And sine as well. Theta. Um, the way you use a tan, which is the first one right here, is that you have to take the, essentially the sine and divide it by the cosine, and that would be the, the value that you're going to put inside the calculator in order to get the angle. Is that right? So far, so good. <clears throat> uh, the problem is, is that sometimes you're going to have problems because if, let's say, these two were positive, Okay, uh, wait, uh, yeah, if these two were positive like this, um, then you're going to get in the first quadrant, is that right? <clears throat> but if they were both negative, then the negative and the negative will cancel. And even though that this is actually the negative, it's the third quadrant, this example right here, this is the third quadrant, but when you put negative divided by negative, they will cancel out. And then the answer you're going to get is in the first quadrant. You get what I mean? And similarly, uh, if you have this situation, if this was negative and, or if this was negative, once again, in both cases, you're always going to get a negative turn. You get what I mean? And over here, you're always going to get a negative turn as well. You get what I mean? Over here, you're always going to get a positive turn. And over here, you're always going to get a positive turn. And that's why somebody said uh, plus 90 and 80, whatever. The problem is, is that the, despite the fact that you have different combinations, you cannot tell whether you are here first quadrant or fourth quadrant. And here, you cannot tell whether you're in the second quadrant or the third quadrant. You will have to adjust the answer you get from the calculator yourself by knowing the signs. And then you have to adjust by plus 80, minus 80, and so on and so forth. And this is the problem with ATAM. Because a tan takes only one value, which is the result of uh, uh, sine over cosine. However, a tan 2 does not take that. It takes directly the sine and cosine separately. So a tan, actually, the x right here is the cosine, and the y is the sine. And when you input the value, you also input the, the, the negatives or the positive. So you're always going to tell the, the function which quadrant you're in. 
and therefore it will give you always the correct answer. I know this is a long answer, but the, the answer I was looking for is that this right here, a tan takes the tangent directly, but this a tan two takes the cosine and sine separately, and therefore a tan two cannot determine which quadrant you're coming from, but this one will be built in, determine the quadrant, and it will always give you the correct answer. Always correct. This one, uh, the a tan, you must adjust the answer. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is not uh, written in someone else. This is, I just thought about it. I, I was hoping that someone would have known this. Okay, so that's why if you're ever going to do inverse tangent um, and you're using a calculator, you always have to put this in mind that you have to pay attention to the quadrants. Okay, okay, 50 plus already, so time is up. So we're going to stop right here. Uh, in the next class, we're going to continue. Um, <coughs> <coughs> In the next class, we're going to go quickly through these, and then we're going to do, uh, we're going to work on the lap sheet. Okay, so thank you guys very much for this, for coming here today. Um, I know you're coming, but thanks anyway. And then I will see you next week uh, in our uh, discussion. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, and I'll see you next week uh, when we... Now, if you are comfortable with C, you don't have to wait for next week. You can already begin working on the tutorial. You can definitely start watching my video because in my videos, the ones on YouTube, I actually go through the tutorials. So I suggest strongly you start working on that. Okay. All right, guys. So all the best, guys, and I'll see you next week. Take care, guys. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. You, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. You're absolutely welcome.